Welcome to Adventures with a Very Small Lathe. I've been using a tailstock die holder in my last few videos, but nobody has asked in the comments how I fitted a third party die holder to the Broxon lathe, which doesn't have a standard tailstock taper. Instead it has a B12 chuck taper, though like a number of the Broxon lathe's features, this is undocumented. It only became obvious because the shaft supplied with the official Proxon tailstock chuck is symmetric. The taper that fits into the chuck is obviously exactly the same as the taper that goes into the tailstock and neither end is specifically marked. Proxon offer an official tailstock die holder but it's expensive, only takes one size of die and has a straight shank meaning it needs to be fitted into a chuck. The key to using a cheap imported die holder was a fact I stumbled across by accident. B-series chuck tapers are the same as Morse tapers but half the length. According to Wikipedia, a B12 taper is the same as the large end of a Morse 1 taper, so all I needed to do was buy a die holder with a Morse 1 taper and remove the excess length. Here I'm setting up the die holder shaft to remove the excess length with a parting tool. The shaft is too large to fit through the chuck and holding it the other way around would be difficult with the tapered end, so I'm going to have to make the cut a long way from the chuck. I used the diameter of the end of the chuck shaft to determine the point where I needed to cut. I was focused on making sure I didn't leave it too long, as this would prevent it from sitting in the taper securely. Obviously nothing can go wrong with removing too much material. My first attempt to make the parting cut wouldn't bite. I was relying on the taper not being too hard, as it's a cheap tool, but the outer surface was hard enough that a carbide parting tool couldn't get enough depth to cut. To give the tool a better chance, I used a regular tool to skim the way the surface material, hoping that it was case hardened and that the material underneath would be easier. After a few more adjustments to the tool height it worked. The material underneath cut pretty freely. There are a couple of lessons for me here. The first is that this isn't a good camera position for this kind of operation, or anywhere I need to apply a lot of cutting oil. The second lesson is that a part needs to be held very securely during a parting operation. I should have used the forge or chuck which has a larger bore. When the remaining diameter became too weak, it bent, and the resulting pitch tore the insert out of the parting blade, twisting the metal. The part was fine however, and the remaining diameter broke apart easily. The remnant of it was easy to clean up, and after a finishing pass, chamfer and deburr, the part was ready to try in the tailstock. It turns out to work just fine. The shaft sits nicely in the taper, doesn't wobble, and the tailstock has no problem with the weight. There is a problem, however. When I retract the tailstock, the shaft isn't pushed out as it should be. I cut it a little too short, and as we all know, there's no way to put material back. I decided to lengthen the end with a shim. To ensure a solid fit, I decided to drill and thread the shaft and make a shim like a custom screw. I checked the protrusion of the Proxon chuck shaft to determine exactly how much longer it needed to be. I indicated and centred the shaft off camera before centre drilling.
I really need a proper tap follower, but most commercially available followers have a diameter too large for my tailstock. I'll add that to the project list. I cut the thread using all three taps in a set so it was cut as close to the bottom as possible. I only caught the first pass on camera as showing all three would be repetitive. I hadn't drilled the hole to any particular depth, so I checked the depth of the standard screw to determine what length to make the shim part. Despite the mistake, the die holder fits into the tailstock well enough to use it already, so I was able to use it for its own project without having to resort to this old Tony's time travelling trick. I flipped the die around for a second pass so I could cut the thread right up to the shoulder to make sure it fits snugly against the shaft. Don't forget to lock the tool post. I used Loctite 242 for no other reason than it's the only thread lock I had to hand. The shim shouldn't be subject to any torque in normal use, so the only real concern is making sure it doesn't vibrate loose. Thank you. 
it works. I hope you enjoyed this interlude between episodes of my major project. Let me know if you'd like to see more quick projects like this. I'll be back working on the Watchmaker's faceplate in the next video.